Hello and welcome. Well, today marks a significant milestone as we celebrate our 100th podcast. You know, upon reflection during planning for this anniversary episode, the one and only topic I felt compelling enough to warrant appointment as the commemorative episode was to address the topic of mental health. COVID has touched a raw nerve and tested each and every one of us, our strength, vigor, sensitivities, and vulnerabilities. This difficult and unimaginable set of circumstances has required us to draw on strengths that we didn't know we had, purely because there hasn't been any other choice than to dig deep to find them. So today's discussion is in support of those who have found our new normal particularly challenging as we take perspective on just how arduous this point in history really is for children, parents, grandparents, and all humanity. To help discuss this topic, we welcome our special guest, Tracy Adams, CEO of Your Town, a charity which includes services such as Kids Helpline, Australia's only free confidential 24-7 online and phone counselling service for children and young people aged 5 to 25, also Parentline, that provides wraparound counselling and support resources to enable Australian parents and their families to live safer, happier lives. It's a great honour to have you join us today, Tracy. Thank you for your time. How are you? It's great to be here, especially on such a special occasion, and I'm, I'm fine and uh, looking forward to our conversation. Oh, likewise. You know, it, and it's really incredible that it's taken a catastrophe such as COVID for people to finally feel comfortable to open up and talk about mental health. You know, COVID has shone a light and brought to the forefront the issue, which until now seems like it's, it really has been a t- subject with a stigma attached you know I've personally had family with severe like mental health issues and retrospectively looking back um, people in the past were always more comfortable to sweep the issues under the carpet than to address them more so I guess fear for rejection and or judgment of what other people may have thought of them so just initially I'd love to, to know do you think that COVID has helped break down some of these barriers? And if so, how? Well, I think you're right. Stigma is still very evident around mental health. And what we have seen, uh, I think, is wonderful courage by children and young people in particular. We've had a real surge in demand for Kids Helpline and, you know, we're getting more than 9,000 contacts a week. So oh, wow. I really want to congratulate kids because they're leading the way. They've got the courage to say, you know, I, I really want to talk to somebody about this. I, I'm really just not feeling myself or, you know, things are going on around me and I, and I feel anxious or I'm depressed and I'm not sure how I'm going to get out of it. So, you know, I really want just to speak highly for the resilience and the help seeking that children are showing. I, I think there is certainly still so much more we can do. We know, for example, particularly young men, uh, maybe men in, in, in more broad terms, aren't so comfortable to be help seekers. Uh, and we need, we do need to create an environment of safety and to feel that people can be validated, to be safe, and importantly, can get the support they need when they need it. And um, and obviously, with Kids Southline, we're firm believers in that we do need to be twenty four seven, because when you when somebody makes that decision to seek help or to have a conversation. Um, it's going to be much more challenging if they don't have somebody else there to hear them Mm -hmm. (laughs) and to be with them. And and so, you know, I really think it's so important that when people build up that courage or or find that space to actually say, you know what, I'm going to bring this to the table, I want to have a conversation, to then be turned away uh, is incredibly challenging. Yes. Now, I understand you're soon to celebrate your 30th anniversary with your town. Is it this year? And also... I, I recently, yeah. Just I've been with the organisation, actually, before we even started Kids Helpline. So I feel very passionately about it as a service. I'm incredibly proud of what it's done. Uh, and incredibly proud that we are able to do it because the community see the value in what we do. And we never take that for granted. Uh, when you run a service like Kids Helpline and, and you're working with five to 25 year olds, you're also part of those children's lives in other ways. And we know that many parents, and indeed right across the community, are often the reference point for a young person to use Kids Helpline. So that trust, that affirmation, uh, that's a really powerful thing. And, and you know, as I say, I'm, I'm proud to be part of the organisation that's been able to achieve that. 
And and also you were appointed position of um, CEO 13 years ago. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> and the Kids Health One's got a big anniversary next year, turning 30 in 2021. So lots to celebrate. But yeah. with you know, three decades of experience, you've overseen Kids Helpline delivering support services to thousands of children through some of Australia's toughest times from natural disaster, disasters like floods, as example. So I'd love to know, I mean, how has COVID-19 um, proven to be different with regards to this, the type of support services children are requesting help currently? Um, and how does this sort of compare to other times, if any? Well, I think COVID has been a very unique time and continues to be a unique time. For a lot of children, it took away what we actually knew was going to happen around us. So even when we've had major floods or bushfire events, and we started the year in such tragic circumstances, it didn't actually take away the feeling for so many about what the future was still going to hold. There was almost a sense of it was happening in isolation and as traumatic as it was and, and continues to be for so many of those families, it didn't actually alter the life of everybody else. And so COVID has, has changed everybody's engagement in the way we operate. And for children, um, you know, the things that they just took for granted, they weren't available anymore. So we have seen that, that lack of certainty. We've certainly seen a heightening of the way that children are worried about their families. Uh, it started by children really being quite fearful about the well-being and the health of their parents and their grandparents. So children feeling... Um, you know, we saw so much in the media about what was happening overseas, such confronting stories about death and, and what was happening. So there's a, there was almost an immediacy of children feeling that, that that security of their own family would be taken, what would happen. And then it started to sort of move into, you don't go to school anymore, you're at home, you're not able to play with your friends. Uh, all of that, you may not even be able to see your grandparents, your extended family. So all of the things that we have become so normal to us uh, and normal to children was, was no longer there. And even now, we actually don't have the same level of what is going to happen down the line. And, and children are still in that space, as, as so many are. Um, you know, we continue to see from overseas as well, um, things being changed all the time. So the level of change has been huge. There's no clarity around when that change is going to finish. Um, or, you know, we, we so freely now talk about the new normal. Mm -hmm. but what is it? What, what is the new normal? What does it mean? Because it changes yes. all the time. And I think that's something we've got to be careful about. What is the new normal when we really um, don't know what it looks like? Yes. Now, we published your article titled Children Experiencing Serious Impacts During Pandemic, which addresses a new report analysing the issues children experiencing due to COVID and are raising during counselling sessions. Now, could you just tell us a little bit about um, this article and the new report findings? Sure. So um, we have a, a wonderful relationship with the Human Rights Commission, the children, National Children's Commission's office, and um, they contacted us and said, look, we really want to represent children and you've got great data. So how about we come together and we really analyse the counselling contacts that you've had. It was between January and the end of April at that time. Uh, and let's look for what sort of themes and how we can re represent the voice of children to make sure it's not being lost across our communities. And so the report has done that, it's taken the counselling contacts where young people specifically told our counsellors that they were connecting to, with them as a result of COVID. So uh, we have so many, we have tens of thousands of contacts about so many issues, but this was really drawn from where our counsellors had uh, in the case file noted that the young person directly came through because of COVID. Uh, and what we saw there is things like um, how young people were being impacted around their education, the fear of what that was going to bring, heightened levels of anxiety, uh, their mental health. Some young people who had existing mental health conditions found it very exacerbated because of COVID. Of they may not have had access to their support networks. Um, all of these things became triggers. Uh, the family relationship dynamic. Uh, you're now at home uh, all the time with the family. Unfortunately, not all children live in safe homes and how that was going to impact yep. them. And also, uh, you know, children worried about their parents. Um, their parents might have lost their jobs. So we've certainly seen heightenedness around that sensitivity to parents' employment and what it's going to mean to the household. 
and, and those general loss of connections. So the report uh, draws from those counselling contacts and represents the voices of children, uh, little case studies about what some of those children have said across different categories and, and really um, aligns to what else has been happening across our communities by other organisations as well. Uh, and so it's really making sure that um, in the height of everything else that happens around us that the voices of children are still represented because we know there's going to be work to do as we come out of COVID and let's all hope that we do come out of COVID um, because you know you don't just suddenly go from an, a major event such as this and think that things will go back to the way they were. Yes I mean so has the pandemic seen a surge in demand for kids helpline services since the start of the pandemic like throughout Australia and I guess if so how then? Sure no well definitely so pre-pandemic um, we would average about 6,000 contacts a week to Kids Helpline uh, and since the pandemic averaging uh, at least 9,000 contacts a week um, we've been up as high as 10,000 in a week uh, we've also seen significant growth in young people who really want to use the resources and knowledge to help themselves. So the Kids Helpline uh, website is a great mm -hmm. space for that. And we've had more than a million extra uh, you know, eyeballs coming onto the Kids Helpline website using those resources. So we know that that also says to us that young people want information. They want to go to places that they trust that information. And I think this is really important. Um, particularly for parents, you want you, you want to have confidence that when you, when your kids are getting information, it's the sort of information that you want them to have. Mm -hmm. And um, and so we've seen an increase in, in, in certainly wanting to connect with our counsellors, but also just wanting to be able to say, you know what, I do feel anxious. What can I do? I don't need to talk to a counsellor. What's what are the sorts of things that I could work through? And um, and I think that's speaks volumes for young people. Mm, I understand that Kids Helpline has helped over 8 million children contact um, um, you guys for support during your 30 years, which is really an incredible number of, of children, considering that it's their, their choice to pick up the phone and or to make that contact. So congratulations on helping and making a difference to so many like, children's and families' lives. Um, I'd love to know from your perspective, what are some of the main concerns and issues that children are raising when contacting Kids Helpline about their mental health at the moment? Yeah, so mental health is, is the one, uh, is the number one reason why a young person connects with the Kids Helpline counsellor and, and that can be um, the full range of mental health. So it can be young people who may be experiencing anxiety, depression, right through to young people who have very, very <coughs> significant mental health challenges. And, and what our counsellors can do um, is continue to have a long term relationship with the young person. So one of the unique factors about Kids Helpline is that if a young person connects with a counsellor, uh, they can be they can be validated. The counsellor works with them on strategies for what their needs might be. But that young person can come back to the same counsellor into the future. That's wonderful. And so we have many young people whose relationship has continued on for a number of years, for example. Um, they may well be supported by a face-to-face -face, counsellor at school or a psychologist in the community. Um, or indeed through different uh, different services, but they can keep coming back to the counsellor they know. And because of Kids Helpline's 24-7, uh, we're often there when potentially their face-to-face -face supports might not be. So, um, you know, mental health continues to be the big one. Family relationships is another really big one, and particularly for our younger cohort of you know, younger children, um, their family relationships is number one for the five to 10-year-old cohort. It's it's, you know, things that are going on in the home, uh, relationships with siblings, relationships with parents, worry about parents, uh, worry about what's going to happen to their family in the future. And, and of course, it's been a really challenging time for children who potentially may not live with both of their parents. And so are potentially used to being able to move across different family homes. And that may not have been so easy over COVID, particularly when parents have been in different states. And so children have had to deal with that and be supported through that. Um, we, of course, unfortunately, our counsellors are presented every single day um, with children who are at imminent harm, either from the hand of someone else or at their own hands. So we're dealing with suicide presentations, mm. we're dealing with child abuse every single day. But, but generally issues relating to anxiety levels, fear of the unknown, missing their friends and what it means long term, um, would they be some of the, the general, um, more general sort of 
so some of the, they're, they're really the emotional well-being issues that are, that are just generally making young people perhaps feel not as not as buoyant as they might be it may not be it's not that it's really a mental health issue it's really emotional well-being and yes. that's certainly a big one as well mm -hmm. um, making sure that you know that, that they do have those strategies to manage and, and i think importantly uh, that we don't allow children to feel that there's, that there's a stigma attached to that and, and that they can talk, talk to their mum and dad, they can talk to their friends. For some children, it's really about exactly being able to do that. Uh, they want to be able to talk to mum and dad, but they don't want to worry them. And that's something that often our counsellors share that children, young people say to them, oh, you know, mum and dad, I, I just couldn't tell them because they'd be so worried if they knew that I was feeling this way. So what our counsellors do so often is, is actually say to the young person, well, let's talk that through. Let's let's really validate that. Let me give you the strategies. Because How wonderful. Because they're probably going to be more worried if you don't tell them. So, yes. um, you know, I think children try to protect their parents. And who have you found is most um, mostly calling for help? Like what demographic? Well, the service is five to 25 year olds. Um, we've seen an increase in our young cohort. So the younger, the five to 10 have increased over COVID, but the big users of Kids Healthline are really in those teenage years, sort of the 14 to 18 year olds. Mm -hmm. uh, that's obviously a time there's often a lot of transitioning happening in the lives of young people as well. A lot of dynamics around those whole relationships. Um, but we've certainly seen um, a younger cohort increasing over this time. And, and I think they too have faced so many challenges over COVID. As well. And is it ma like mainly females? Um, it is still mainly females. And, and I, you know, we're, we're trying hard to, to do more in this space of encouraging young men. Um, interestingly, um, we've had a lot of uh, young men using the Kids Helpline website. So the resources is growing at a faster rate than female but their actual help seeking is not changing. So about 75% of their counselling contacts are all female. Mm -hmm. um, I can't believe that our young men um, in community don't face many challenges. I, I really believe well, it's related to stigma. Yeah, I mean, so how can we engage young boys to have open conversations about their feelings? Do you think that this is part of a larger conversation about breaking down barriers of gender stereotypes to allow boys to understand that it's just okay to be vulnerable and to give them permission to talk about their feelings? What are your thoughts? Well, it's a really tough one. I, I actually, we, we were just talking about this internally last week ourselves and that we've really got to do more work with young men and we need to engage them in, in this we need to be saying to them, help us, help us understand what we need to be doing, uh, not just at Kids Healthline, but I really think across community, what we need to do to enable young people to feel that they have the confidence to, to seek help, to not feel that by doing so they're weak, to not feel that there's something wrong with them, that they should be able to cope, isn't this the right thing to do? Every, I see everybody else out there, every other guy I know seems to be coping what's wrong with me. Why do they put that pressure on themselves? So we, we need to understand more. We need to have as many channels as possible. So when we started Kids Helpline, we were just telephone. Today it's telephone, it's web chat, it's email. Increasingly, we're using social media. What channels are going to be enabling to young men and, and to men in general? What, what can we do? Kids Helpline's already confidential and anonymous, so it, it doesn't seem to make a difference. But we know that when a young man uses Kids Helpline and connects with our counsellors, they often come back. So it works for them. It's, you know, they get what they want and they feel heard and they, and they obviously the experience has given them resources and, and tools to cope uh, and they return for more, but they are in small numbers. And I think they're the, they're the young men we have to learn from. Yes. What was it that they did that allowed them to use it mm -hmm. uh, and, and keep working on uh, as much as we can with our, you know, with our own sons and, and the men around us to, to try and create as much normality as possible. And um, it's not easy. I, I know when my own son was a teenager, even getting a few words out of him was a, was a chore at times. So, it's, um, it's, it's a challenge, but I think it's something that we should never give up on. 
Yes, and I really hope that we can sort of stop boys from suppressing their feelings. And I'd love to know, do you think we need to provide more guidance to boys to give them the tools and the language just to articulate their feelings? Because a lot of the time we just haven't necessarily, from my understanding with gender stereotypes, just provided them enough tools and just the guidance and the support because um, it's, it's one of those things with gender stereotypes that we really almost sort of put strength and power onto a pedestal but um sensitivity and vulnerability given that you know every boy um, has the right to to be able to show their feelings and to feel comfortable uh, with with, uh, expressing their feelings however it's not something that um that society has necessarily supported up until now and i really hope this is something that as things are changing and there is a bit of a pivotal moment i believe with with um thought processes um having more discussions about mental health as an example having more discussions like this about uh gender stereotypes that we will give hopefully boys the right tools to be able to allow and the language to articulate their feelings like what are your thoughts i I agree and i think we we should think about it in the context sometimes it can be really hard to talk about how you're feeling not not just in boys but in general terms and we tend to rely on people to be able to do that. And I think we need to use new technologies where perhaps people can express things without having to verbalise it, that they can use different tools. Um, you know, for example, if they were engaging with Kids Helpline, that make it easy for them to convey what they're feeling, to allow somebody else to open up the dialogue on their behalf and to create that for them in that safe space. It's a really challenging space to to sometimes open up to somebody when what you're feeling is so difficult to express. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we we know, and young people tell us that, I'm actually not sure how I convey how how I am feeling. We need to give them the tools, yeah. That's right, and our counsellors often play the role of gradually building that relationship, building the confidence to allow a young person to slowly start to come forward. And we've found that when we opened up our web chat service and we were doing, and our counsellors are doing online counselling, young people don't have to verbalise. It's a really safe space that they're, they're really typing it even. So they're getting it out. Know, that's right. And, and I think we've mm-hmm. just got to keep enabling and putting all these tools and, and I think encouraging a conversation. And, you know, one of the things I love about Are You OK Day, it's really doing something to say, all of us can share in responsibility of just checking in and, and not just paying lip service to it because I think it's easy to, to say to somebody, how are you? People's immediate reaction tends to be, I'm fine, but are they really? And, and mm-hmm. you know, do we actually stop and say, how are you? You know, you don't look great today. Is everything okay? You know, just wanted to check in. You know, I'm always here. You know, sometimes that can just continually be enough to build that safety that you're not going to be judged if you actually say, you know what, I'm not okay today. And, you know, you know, and just being able to well, We need up. to be so, asking this so much more than just one day a year. Oh, you know, absolutely. But, be- but I think that's the means of it. Yeah, one day, yeah. top of mind, and let's all be committed to, to just being able to put it out there in the first place, because even with children, no matter what the gender, sometimes they just can't express what they what they're feeling. Absolutely. And it's so important to just to normalise softer behaviours such as sensitivity and just asking for help, especially for boys. That's one thing they're probably not used to doing is asking for help so much because they believe it's the right thing to do to be macho and to be male and uh, masculine and strong. And it's, it's actually the flip side of that. And it's absolutely fine to, to talk about their feelings. And talking about your feelings is an incredibly important part about of, of well-being, I guess, too, isn't it? And builds emotional resilience and just to help us feel supported. What do you think? It is, and we know that that children and young people often play a very important role with each other, with their peers. Um, You know, many children express that they've opened up to their friends before they'll open up to anybody else because it is is that sort of safe relationship. And, Mm. uh, you know, we need to be thinking about how we equip our children with those things that are presented to them, and that's really challenging. But often young people will, will contact us, for example, to share that, their friend has disclosed that they're harming themselves or they're living in homes that aren't safe and what can they do and how how can they support their friend in that space so you know i i think we know that children and young people are help seekers but they're also people also people that are carrying the burden of, of worry about what others are what others are going through so mm. 
uh, you know, we, we need to be equipping all of ourselves as, as community with as much uh, knowledge about where we can go, where, what resources are good, how we can have good conversations. Um, as you say, let's be open about how we're feeling and, and use it as a way of, of generally creating a caring and nurturing community of, of so many people. And, and how have you found the lockdown in each state has affected different people? And like, what are you hearing at the moment? I mean, obviously, Victoria, where I'm um, sort of based is, you know, <laughs> we've, we've gone through and going through what we are. But I mean, generally, sort of state to state, what are you hearing? Is it well, much of a variance? Overwhelming consistency in the issues that are impacting young people. Um, but of course, uh, Victoria has gone through, uh, you know, a real challenge with the second wave and a, and a lockdown. And we've seen, I think, between July and August, a sort of twenty percent increase in contacts from from Victoria. And and you know, mm. I think it was a really challenging time um, for, for families and and young people because there'd been that period of lockdown. People sort of went back to school, back to work, and then another lockdown. And, and so that sort of heightens that sense of is this ever going to end? What is the new normal? Is this the way it's going to be now? Um, you know, this heightened concern about will we come out of it? Um, you know, so I, I think it's to be expected that that we really did see such an increase from Victoria over that time. But mm. the issues and the presentations, they're very consistent nationally. So and, in, um, in saying that then, what do you recommend parents can do then to offer support during this time to help even just prevent any sort of mental health issues um, from occurring with their children? Is communication the key? Is that what it yeah. is? I, I think we... Children are, have so much information, we all do, we're almost bombarded with information and I think it is about having genuine conversations. We can't take away the seriousness of, your, of what we're living with, but it is about trying to maintain some positivity about it because mm -hmm. otherwise it's very distressing constantly, layer upon layer every day and it's not just children who are impacted by that. Of course. So being able to convey some sense of positivity, creating those positive some conversations. Optimism, yeah. Are, and optimism, I, I, you know, we often talk around here, for example, one of our key jobs right now is keeping hope alive and let's, let's be positive about that because I think that, that, that optimism is so important. Mm -hmm. Children's routines have changed a lot and a lot of children, you know, they, their routines mean a lot to them in the way that the structure yes. of, of knowing what's going to happen. So think about how you might create new routines to allow children to have that safety space of this is what we know happens when, um, it may not be the same routine they have before, but it can still be a routine. Yes. Uh, I think keeping focused on, you know, the really simple things, good sleep, good exercise, keeping those sorts of things going. Um, you're checking in with your children because they may not be the ones to come with you, but, you know, having those conversations, look, I've noticed that you've been quiet or you're clearly not sleeping well. Are you okay? Let's have a conversation. You know, and I think we can't expect children to always take the leadership role expressing how they're feeling. Yes. The parents are noting, noticing that there's changes in behaviour, recognise that and, and sort of sit down and, and have a conversation. They may not open Great up. Great advice. Yes. Open the door to having that. Um, yes. The other thing is, you know, use some of these resources. on, on the, For example, on the Kids Helpline website. If there's four whole, ways to enter support, isn't there? There's four yes. different Yes. Yes. And so... The COVID page has got lots of stuff about anxiety and different resources. They're great ways that parents and children can have conversations together about it. Um, and, and I think sometimes it's okay to say, you know what, what you're feeling is quite normal because we're feeling it too. Mm -hmm. and, and sort of almost um, acknowledge and validate that it is okay to have these concerns. If you think they're getting out of hand, know where to go to for support encourage that help seeking mm -hmm. um, parents can't be everything all the time and it's okay for yes. parents to actually acknowledge that and, and as i've mentioned earlier many parents connect with kids helpline with their children to get that support and encourage it so you know i think all of those little things continue to validate for children and of course we all play a role at keeping children safe and if we know children are living in homes that are unsafe now, we do need to be thinking about how we how we support and check in with them. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I think it does at this time 
um, you know, our caring and our nurturing is obviously for the children in our homes, but but also consciously thinking about those who, who may be in homes that aren't safe that, that absolutely you, that you are aware of. So, so children can reach out um, via four different um, sort of resources: being phone. Second is so web chat. So the phone one eight hundred fifty five one eight hundred um, kidshelpline dot com dot au. Uh, they can contact us by uh, email at kidshelpline. And then, of course, we've got our great social channels, Instagram and Facebook, lots of tips and information and resources on there um, and, and really just bite sized information. So every day we'll have something different and we might have little tips about managing anxiety or managing cyber safety because children are all online and we know <laughs> we've had a slight increase in cyber safety issues as well. You know, just trying to put information into the hands of, of young people and the broader community that we think can be helpful at this time. As well. And it gives them a good variance. So they've got the phone, they've got the web chat, email. And Circles is, is I believe, a new group uh, counselling um, opposed to one-on-one. -on -one. So I understand Circles um, is a new right. service. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And, yeah. and what have you found are the benefits of that service? My circle uh, is really for our teens um, age cohort and a slightly different, it still has the qualified counsellor in it. So we know the value of peers coming together, sharing experiences, validating that they're not alone and how they feel. So the My Circle allows up to 100 young people to be involved uh, in a circle with the counsellor, but sharing their own um, connection with each other, their experiences, the strategies they've used, um, in a way that's safe, so nobody knows each other. They're basically assigned a sort of like an avatar as they come into the circle. Oh, that's great. What we've, what we've found is that it's very validating for a young person to suddenly realise I'm not the only one that feels like this. And that young person... So powerful. That was, that's right, who I was connecting with has actually come up with strategies that I can go away and now use myself. So mm -hmm. and the counsellor is always in the circle to make sure that all the conversation is safe, uh, that a young person who may present um, in crisis is actually being able to be supported and taken out of the circle and supported immediately. And we've had times that that's had to happen. Uh, we've had young people who have presented into my circle who aren't using any other service at all, but have very serious issues. And so it's, it's about, again, trying to make sure that we create as many pathways as possible and we really believe that the best way so often to break down stigma is to actually allow young people to come together and share that, their experience. Um, we have a, a really powerful group of young people who are supporting us as an organisation. They have a lived experience of suicide and they, they're sharing with us what helped them, what, means, what it means to them, what we can keep focused on so that we as an organisation can take that knowledge and apply it in a way that we build resources and support other young people. So the more that we can be open, the more we share, the more we encourage people to come together, um, you know, I think it's a great way to keep making sure that we normalise, mm -hmm. helps normalise sharing and we normalise that it's okay to have chat life events that require you to seek support. And what type of resources do you have to help parents? I, I believe there's parent line, but this is government funded in Queensland and Northern Territory only. Um, I just love to know a little bit more about that. And if you'd like to see parent line be a national resource. Um, well, yes, you're right. We run parent line um, here for Queensland parents and for parents and carers, and, and, and that can be grandparents as well. Um, you know, we know that parenting can be challenging and, you know, it's, it, I know it's a cliche, but it's the toughest job in the world, but I, I think it's certainly proving itself to be over COVID. Especially now, yes. So we're being teachers, parents uh, and everything in the home and that's brought so much to different family dynamics. Um, we also ensure that the Kids Helpline website itself has a parents component to it, so parents can use the Kids Helpline resources and it's written for parents how to help their children. For parents with parent line, it's often around um, children's behaviour, children's mental health, parents' parents' own mental health and well-being, family relationship issues, um, how to manage the dynamic of the family as you know going through separation, shared custody, you know some of those elements that can be often very heightened tension times for many families. How to ensure that the children continue to 
to be cared and nurtured despite the many challenges that are going on around them. And the parent, help, parent line counsellors um, play exactly the same role really as our kids helpline counsellors around developing and supporting um, people who are connecting with strategies and connection to resources, but also connection to other local community-based services where people can go and, and create a sense of um, it's normalising. Many parents um, express that they feel that there must be something wrong with them. Other parents appear to be coping, why aren't they? Um, so again, we see stigma um, and unreal expectations yes. sometimes playing a Social role. Social media can do that though. That's right. Parents judge themselves quite harshly. Yeah. Um, and um, the other thing uh, for parents has often been a big issue of recent times is the whole issue around cyberbullying and cyber safety as it of relates course. to children. Parents have often expressed that they feel that their children know much more in that space than they do. So there's particular resources on the Parent Line website, which anybody can, can utilise um, around you know, these sorts of topics to help parents in these spaces. So would I love to see Parent Line National? I would. I, I think parenting is tough. Um, I think if we see children connecting with Kids Helpline and the volumes that we've had, you know, we're getting towards eight and a half million responses. Oh, incredible. You know, we, know, we know parents equally need support about their well-being, their emotional well-being, their care. Uh, we know that parents often haven't had the time to even be thinking about that over COVID while they've been playing so many other roles. But it's so important and all of us need to be able to, to think about ourselves from time to time and, and what we need to do for ourselves to make sure that those around us uh, are being supported in the way we want them to be. Mm. So, and parents can um, contact ParentLine through the website. Um, it's, it's a phone line and there's online resources as well. Is there through the website? Yeah, absolutely. And ParentLine also has social media accounts and, you know, and, and um, so we're very conscious of trying to have as many channels as possible and, um, okay. and, and get the right resources in, into the hands of people when they need them. Yes. Tracy, this has been an incredibly insightful um, and uh, informative and helpful chat today. And once again, really, really honoured for your time. Um, if you were to summarise your key messages for anyone watching and listening um, to this interview today, what would they be? Well, certainly for children and young people, I would say never, ever doubt that there isn't someone there for you and never be fearful to raise, speak up um, because there, there is. We never want our children to feel that they need to suffer alone um, because that, that they don't think anybody cares enough about them. And, um, you know, that, that to us is something that we feel so strongly about. There is someone who cares, no matter the circumstances, and there is always... Um, someone there no matter what the issue and, and for parents uh, I, I think it's really about acknowledging that you don't have to do it alone and, and there's no shame in seeking support to best help children and young people um, you know we we again um, you know it takes a village to raise a child and, and all of our counsellors they're tertiary qualified uh, they are there they absolutely value and respect the whole family and they know that when they work with a young person it, that that young person is connected to parents and siblings and, and friends. And so we really do see that as being so critically important. So um, we all need to keep working on breaking down the stigma around help seeking and actually really appreciating the fact that there is nothing wrong um, with saying, I just need some help with this issue. It is such a challenging time, isn't it, for everyone at the moment? And we just don't know how long this is just going to continue on for. So. Hopefully, the, the more people we can get this message out to, um, and as soon as possible, the better. Um, so if parents and children want to reach out for help, whereabouts can they find you? Well, certainly, um, kidshelpline.com.au is a great resource for, ch for parents and children. Um, you know, kids can connect with us on the free call number 1800 55 1800. Uh, and parentline.com.au is also another great resource. If you're social media savvy, and I know so many people are, then, then certainly our Instagram and Facebook sites are also great. So um, I might sound biased, but I think the content is, uh, is, is really valuable. We always get great feedback for it. No, and no doubt it is. And it is 
making a significant difference to people's lives. So congratulations on all your success and all of the wonderful work that you're doing. And once again, thank you for your time, Tracy. And um, yes, we'll hope to have the opportunity to have another chat again in the not too distant future. But in the meantime, congratulations on all the wonderful work that you're doing. Thank you again thank for you your time. Take care. Thank you. Bye.